much for um, that kind introduction, and um, I'm pleased to know you're circumventing the geo block, and it's not just my children who managed to do that. Um, look, first of all, my sincere apologies for running late this evening to present. We had one of those ghastly technical breakdowns when you lose all of your content and you're restructuring it at the last minute. And I think I've got one sheet here which says, just click and keep talking. <laughs> but I'm, I'm reliably informed that there are at least three people in the room who have volunteered to deliver this presentation for me. And looking around, I can see that more than qualified to do so, including my esteemed predecessor, Murray Green, who is uh, with us here in the audience. But I'd also like to acknowledge the um, A double I, a Victoria Council members here tonight, immediate past President Les Rowe and National Vice President Zara Kempton. I think that the um, Australia Institute of International Affairs provides a great service to Australian foreign policy debate in Australia. And tonight I've been asked to speak on the topic of soft power in the digital era. And I'm very pleased to be able to share some of our work in that area with you this evening. Do you know well enough what a clicker? So look, before I get started on what we're doing, I'd like to start by looking at some soft, uh, some definitions that's appropriate given we're surrounded by lots of writings on the topic. And we did um, extensive research as we're developing our strategy and gaining an understanding of some of those writings on um, uh, public diplomacy and how that would impact on the, our strategy as we developed it. Joseph Nye said that soft power is the ability to affect others to obtain the outcomes one wants through attraction rather than coercion or payment. But Millison rightly states that soft power remains an elusive concept for most officials and indeed also for many academics. Public diplomacy seems to be a somewhat easier concept to grasp though because it's inherently practical, hands-on qualities and the fact that it can be framed in the context of a wider diplomatic practice. Indeed, as we know, Australia has many points of attraction, including Australia's multicultural assets and track record as a tolerant society with strong political governance systems which help make Australia a desirable place to visit and live and a sound investment and study destination. But in order to capitalise on these assets, we need to be seen and heard. Hillary Clinton remarked that we are in an information war and we cannot assume that this youth bolt that exists not just in the Middle East but in so many other parts of the world really know much about us. And it's this whole idea of having people understand us and connect with them that has been at the core really of the strategy that we've been developing. But in a fiercely competitive environment, governments can no longer afford to push information out in the hope that foreign publics will just tune in. The space is simply too crowded. The new public diplomacy has been developed to address these challenges. And Mellison outlines that some of its main features are long-term relationship building, a dialogue practice that does not underestimate the listening dimension, and an emphasis on the importance of social actors as credible interpreters and receivers, particularly in cross-cultural dialogue. And we believe that the 75 years of Radio Australia in particular, and relationships in the region, is testimony to the importance that we place on the observation made there. The new, new um, public diplomacy acknowledges that in the pursuit of soft power, it's no longer just the realm of Western countries. Non-traditional actors are investing in soft power in a big way. According to a recent edition of the Asian Security Journal, China now spends almost US nine billion per year on public diplomacy and other activities intended to boost its soft power. And this includes more than US one billion spent per year on its international news channel alone. It's important to note that the Australian public is supportive of stronger relationships with our neighbours. The Lowy Institute poll in 2012 confirmed that 94% of Australians considered it important for Australia to be seen in a positive light by people from countries in our region. And 82% were in favour of the Australian government funding broadcast services or other programs to communicate with people from countries in our region with the aim of improving relations. I was in Jakarta quite recently and I met with uh, Anis Baswaran, who's a candidate in the forthcoming elections, and he talked about the importance of this people-to-people um, -people connection, that Australia and Indonesia, he said, will always be neighbours. Governments, of course, will come and go, 
but Australia and Indonesia will always be neighbours. And therefore establishing a method of neighbours getting to understand each other more effectively through media, such as the services we are offering, was a very important um, part of neighbours getting to understand each other well. And in addition to the investment I talked about um, from China uh, just before, I think it's important to also understand that Korea's area and world, Japan's NHK world, Channel News Asia out of Singapore also represent significant investments and broadcasting services into our region. But if international broadcasters are continue to play, are to continue to play an active role in the new public diplomacy, we have to adapt to a changing media environment and be available on the platforms that people are using in order to engage with audiences in the digital era. It's four points that we picked up from the University of Southern California on public diplomacy um, attributes which go to broadcasting best practice. First, participation. Good public diplomacy as it is practiced today emphasizes a two-way dialogue. It's no longer about pushing our message out but establishing a platform and a mechanism for engagement and conversation. Platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Google enable us to engage with audiences in this dimension. Second point is contextualisation. International broadcasters must provide a context to the information they disseminate and act as filters for the copious amounts of information now available to people. Without providing context, we're just one more message going out there into the ether and we're not providing it meaning to the people um, in their situation. Education is the third point. There are fewer closed media environments today than ever before, of course, and even in closed societies, there are ways for people determined to find out specific information to access it. But facilitating and creating tools to access information and to send and receive it and to participate in open dialogue is going to greatly increase the positive impact on any closed society. The fourth and very important point is about transparency. International broadcasting originated as a wartime communications tool, but can help share values and provide a service to those without access to free media. And in placing an emphasis on honest reporting, participatory conversations, listening to listeners and viewers, and mediating information are paramount. And in this way, our new Converge Media Service aims to demonstrate the best practice outlined in those four points that I've just described. We have a new agreement with DFAT now, which commenced in July last year, and it provides for the delivery of an integrated, multi-platform, international media service. And in developing this service, we've had to look really very closely at our markets. How are people consuming media today? The media markets of Asia share many common characteristics, such as the rapid uptake of mobile technologies and digital media. However, there are also enormous differences across economies, cultures, and media preferences in the region. Mobile phones are one of the key means by which Asian audiences access information, and there are over 3.3 billion mobile phone subscribers in Asia, and take-up of mobile devices continues to grow rapidly. Regional internet use has also increased rapidly. At the end of 2011, it was estimated that Asia had over a billion internet users, and internet take-up has continued to grow dramatically. In China, for example, it was reported in January last year that there were more than half a billion Chinese on the internet, of whom almost 56 million, over 10%, used the internet for the first time in 2011. Mobile phones are also increasingly being used to access the internet. And in China, it's estimated that one third of mobile phones are used for internet access. So there are very clear trends towards greater use of online and mobile media among the aspirational and youth segments that comprise key target audiences for Australia's international media services. What we're observing that is in many of these markets, um, mobile phone is, is leapfrogging, if you like, the desktop era that people are only accessing the internet on their mobile phones. And when they have feature phones as opposed to smartphones uh, with applications such as Facebook and uh, um, messaging, audiences think that Facebook is the internet because they've not been through that stage of accessing the internet um, via a desktop device. And this is really important to be considered as we're developing our services. 
So we're attempting to respond to this diversity, and the services we're developing it now reflects an understanding of the cultural aspirations and media consumption habits, audiences' content preferences, and the use of different media platforms in each regional market. We're looking to deliver compelling Australian content via appropriate delivery platforms and to reach those target audiences. And we believe the longevity in the region and strong reputation for independent news and high quality media services will position us well to foster partnerships that promote and support business development. So in short, we're developing a communications network, a soft infrastructure, if you like, to connect with audiences across the region to further public diplomacy and to promote Australian business and trade. I'll have a look now at the Converged International Media Service as it's developing. And I would stress that this agreement for this new service, which brings together Radio Australia, the Australian Network, and our various online and mobile sites, has been initiated since July last year. So we're very much in the early stages. So we started by having, you know, taking a market based approach. Having a look at our key markets, what are people interested in receiving, what devices are they using to access their content, their information, their entertainment, and then to look at platform specific solutions for each market. Developed markets such as I've already talked about, so China and Indonesia have different um, aspects, <coughs> if you like, to a market such as Myanmar, Cambodia, or even PNG. And in developing our services, we need to be very clear about what role we want television to play, or radio to play, or online and mobile to play. Television, for example, we're aiming to evolve into a service which is targeting the A demographics, if you like, within the region, and to provide an information, news, and factual range of content, which is derived from media and independent producers across Australia, and indeed with partners such as um, Channel News Asia. Radio, we're specifically looking at to continue to reach those audiences where we don't have such a developed access to mobile, for example. So in the Pacific, radio continues to be very important and we've focused our attentions there. Also in developing markets in Asia, Cambodia, Myanmar and Laos, radio is still important. But we've moved away from radio in Indonesia, for example, in China and China where other means of accessing media are more prevalent. We want to take content to where the audiences are locally. So while we're one in each market of a range of international services, and we can do much to increase the attraction of our services to local audiences, it's really important to be where they are. So we've emulated strategies successfully deployed by VOA and indeed the BBC World Service to develop partnerships in these key markets where we syndicate programs and content to audiences on the platforms where they are. And I'll get into that in a little bit a little bit more in a moment. But in Indonesia now, for example, monthly we have 875,000 unique users, individuals, accessing our, our content through our platforms and partner platforms through these new syndication partnerships. So we've launched a, an umbrella brand, if you like, so we can tie together what's being offered across Australia Network, Radio Australia, and online and mobile. So Australia Plus acts as an umbrella brand, and its ability to be transformed into Australia Plus India, or Australia Plus PNG, or Australia Plus China enables us to work with this in a digital context um, in a way that traditional platforms such as radio um, have not enabled us to do. We continue to roll out these services across markets and the um, India service was launched last year, um, November, and it showcases the best of Australia including content from the ABC, SBS and user generated content. So photos and stories from people in India and those who've travelled there. My World was themed, which is a user-generated um, uh, space, if you like, in this portal, was themed My Light for that month and appropriately featured images from India's Diwali celebrations. The service is bilingual and new social media pre uh, presences were set up for Twitter and Facebook as well. Our Indonesian site is delivered in Bahasa 
And this is an example of where our team of people who were producing um, radio content in Bahasa Indonesian, shortwave delivery, have now been redirected and retrained and they're delivering content for online, mobile and television in Bahasa. And we've got um, young people going out into Indonesia with one video camera and they're delivering stories which are produced for our services and our partner services across Indonesia. <coughs> this is one of these pages that, that says just keep going, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> have I gone too far? I probably have. Ah, yes, the Mandarin site. Now this is interesting because our, our services into China, and Murray will be well aware of this, we, we had uh, Radio Australia on shortwave and we've had uh, new services going and they're regularly blocked by um, Chinese uh, monitoring authorities. This service focuses not so much on those hard news stories, but on those stories that will connect us and tell the stories of Australia in a way which is not so um, potentially um, challenging to Chinese authorities. It doesn't mean that our news stories aren't out there, they are, but this service enables us to connect with audiences there in a way we've not been able to before, and also to extend our content through partnerships. Um, and I'll talk about the Chinese partnerships in just a minute. This site was um, produced to coincide with the Lunar New Year, and the current Radio Australia Chinese pages um, are now available in multiple points across, um, across China. Let's take a little look at the mobile apps at the moment. So a key element of the strategy, as I've said, is to deliver increased content in language. But to this end, um, we're looking at increasing the amount of content that we're putting out on um, mobile devices. There we go. Okay, so what this does is include an aspect of gamification, if you like. So people can take a photo, they can have access to different prizes for answering correct, correct questions on Australia, and it's a subtle way of introducing key messages about Australia into a market without taking the hard news approach. And you can probably tell that I've, I've got a little bit um, lost here in terms of what we had in the presentation, what we recovered and what we didn't, what we haven't managed to recover. But this has been extremely popular, particularly um, with Chinese audiences and, and is now about to be promoted extensively. We have a partnership now with Sina. Sina in China is the company that produces um, the Weibo site, which is Chinese Twitter and having a partnership with a website with the extensive audience that they have for this content, I think you'll understand <coughs> opens access to significant numbers of audience with audiences we just haven't had before. I've talked about our partnerships and how important they are to us, and just some specifics on that. And if we think about China, for example, where a shortwave radio service has been intermittently blocked and uh, our news and sites, Radio Australia sites, are being blocked. We're now working with partners, um, including the Shanghai Media Group with a reach of 18 million, Beijing TV with a reach of 600 million, and CCTV. And our digital content is extended <coughs> through China Daily Online with 40 million page views per day, QQ, 22 million page views daily, and Sina, which I've already mentioned, 124 million page views per day. So when people comment on our services now and say we have tiny audiences or only expats, it's I think because they're not understanding the new strategy and the extended um, pathways we have now through local partnerships. You'll see here Tempo, which is one of our partners in Indonesia, is an example of how our stories are showing up on their own websites and this content is directly fed from our websites. And here we have Republica, um, now, Republica is a major um, Muslim media company in Indonesia, and they've been known in the past for writing stories and publishing them, which aren't wholly um, complementary to Australia. But they're also cherishing their independent status as a media organisation and valuing the partnership they have with us. So stories that we deliver into the Indonesian market are featured proudly on the front page of their international news site. And in this way, we're able to provide context and extend the understanding of uh, stories which are topical and perhaps top of mind at the time. We're sending our personalities <coughs> overseas increasingly. 
Um, we sent the winners of the triple, I see a number of young faces in the room, you're probably well aware of Triple J Unearthed and the people who, uh, who win those competitions are the musical heroes, I think, and uh, stars of the future. We sent two of those people over to appear in a Beijing young music competition and they were live on uh, national TV out of Beijing in China, which is just a wonderful way to extend cultural outreach, if you like, and particularly with new audiences. Every week we have a, we have a feature in this program out of Shanghai called Cosmo Times, and it looks at fashion, design and art trends in major cities around the world. And you'll be pleased to know, being Melbournians, that Melbourne is the featured city for Australia. And so there are stories from Melbourne and what's going on here culturally every week being broadcast as part of this program alongside of cities like London and New York and Kuala Lumpur. Social media is a very important part, obviously, of this strategy, which involves to reach people, but also engage people. So this Australia plus India um, Facebook page is only really just starting to take, to, you know, to get traction with about 4,600 followers. Australia plus Indonesia, 59,418 followers, and this is just at today. So you can see, and this was launched very recently. So you can see how this is starting to build it, to build and gain engagement, particularly <coughs> with younger audiences. The Australia Plus uh, homepage, Facebook site, if you like, which is quite new, and the um, Mandarin Facebook site. The Learn English site is part of our, a really good example of this converged strategy, I think, to close with. And this is where we've bought the differing Learning English um, offerings from Australian Network, Radio Australia, and our digital sites together under this brand, Learn English. Our Facebook site now has 1,039,580 followers. It's one of the biggest brands now in Australia. And these people are clearly part of an overseas audience base that is growing. They're wanting to learn English. They're not expats. And the reason that this is important is because it provides a link, an opening. I had a wonderful conversation with Alexander Downer about this um, just Thursday last week because he'd been quite critical, as some of you may, observe, may have um, observed, about this aspect of the service. And his point was, and um, I agree with him, that you know we're not aiming to teach English, we're aiming to you know connect with Australian stories and teach people about Australia. And I absolutely agree with that. However, what this is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to present education in Australia, travel in Australia, doing business with Australia, buying Australian products. Imagine if we just converted 10% of that number to come here and study. So this is why we're offering services like this. And indeed, it won't be part of what's offered on the television network or indeed radio services as we move forward. It'll, it'll be contained to an online digital offering. But it's a very, very important way to extend that network <coughs> that we're aiming to develop. And that network across television, radio, online, mobile, and social media is about developing an infrastructure. An infrastructure for communication, for connecting with audiences and people in a region, our neighbors. And so that we can develop a greater understanding, present our public diplomacy, and to promote Australian business and trade. And that's what we're aiming to deliver through this new converged service. So I think we've got to five to seven. <laughs> so despite the chaos of this presentation here, and again, forgive me for this, please. Um, we're, I think, within time, and very, very happy to take questions. So thank you.